Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 178 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Sue Hunter all about hollies. Sue is the owner of Heartwood Nursery and is the president of the Holly Society of America. The plant profile is on osteospermums, and we share what's going on in the garden as well as some upcoming local gardening events and garden tasks in the What's New segment. We close out with the last word on starting the new year off with a bang by Christy Page of Green Prince. This episode, we're joined by Sue Hunter. She is the owner of Heartwood Nursery and president of the Holly Society of America. Welcome, Sue. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate being given the opportunity to discuss hollies and what I do for a living. Yeah, we're so happy to have you, Sue. And because it's wintertime in the mid-Atlantic here, I thought hollies would be a perfect topic to talk about. And we'll dive into everything hollies from selection to planting to pruning. But before we go into that, we'd like to know a little bit about you. And we always like to ask our first-time guests, were they born with chlorophyll in their vein and a green thumb? Well, that's a really good way to put it. Um, So the answer to that question is definitely yes. I was born with chlorophyll in my veins and uh, a green thumb and green fingers. Um, I was the type of child that uh, was very shy and introverted. I preferred to be outside. I hated to be inside. I was always sitting in the woods. Um, as, as a child, I would collect holly berries and acorns and put them in boxes and tins under my bed, much to the dismay of my parents. Um, <laughs> so I, I was always drawn to nature in some regard. Um, I remember when I was in seventh grade, we were required to fill out a form to see what potential career we may be interested in. And after I filled the form out, um, the career that came up for me was something to do with forestry. And I was promptly called down to the guidance counselor. And this, this was in the late sixties, early seventies. And I was, very dismayed when the guidance counselor told me there must be some mistake. And he suggested that I take the test over again. And I just was um, very upset about that. And obviously I did not listen to him. (laughs) I decided to pursue my passions anyway. Did he assume forestry was just a male profession? Yes, I believe that was the case because there really weren't a lot of women going into outdoor careers, environmental careers, or nursery careers, or forestry careers at that time. Did you go to school for a horticulture degree? How did you pursue your profession? I did not. I kind of picked up a lot of things on my own. I read a lot of books. I graduated from high school in 1976. I grew up in the Perry Hall, Maryland, Parkville, Maryland area. Um, Environmental science was not offered in high school the way it is now. Um, I was attracted to biology and horticulture. I did two years at Towson State. And again, they were just starting to get together an environmental program or major there. Um, They did not have it when I went. I became very bored. Um, The botany and taxonomy classes that Towson had at that time 
were not offered very often because not many students were taking them. So the classes were very, very small. And I decided I wanted to travel around the country for a while. So I, I did that. I lived in many different places around the country for about five years. And I decided to move back to the area in the 1980s, mid 80s, where I started working for some large wholesale production nurseries in the Baltimore County area. And I was fortunate enough to be employed in their propagation departments. Thanks to some really good mentors in the industry, and people that really encouraged me. I gained a reputation for being able to propagate difficult tree and shrub species. And if I could just say a little bit about what the word propagation means for some of your listeners who may not be familiar with it. Um, propagation sure. is not, not only a science, uh, propagation is the intuitive art and science of growing and starting plants from seed, cuttings, grafting, and or division. And how did you come to have your own nursery now in York, Pennsylvania? Well, I'm south of York. I'm just over the Maryland line, just over Maryland line in south central York County. I actually started my nursery in northern Baltimore County, and then after a series of very challenging circumstances that were presented to me um, in my life, I decided to move my nursery to some property that I owned here in South Central York County, Pennsylvania in 2006. So my nursery, which is now also a certified Holly Society of America, Holly Arboretum, that is open to the public. And I am also an environmental preserve. Um, I'm preserved through the York County Farms and Natural Lands Trust. I do have events here at my nursery throughout the year. Um, so the, the nursery started out as just a piece of kind of like a blank canvas. It's a total of 70 acres. I have 35 acres in mature hardwoods, and then the other 35 acres is in cultivated nursery stock. And that is something that I've built up over the years since the early 2000s. Mm, interesting. So if somebody wanted to visit the collection, would they have to make an appointment in advance? Not necessarily. I do have regular hours. We're open Mondays through Saturdays, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, I don't suggest coming on icy or snowy days just for logistics and safety reasons. But I do have special events where I give formal tours throughout the nursery and I talk specifically about hollies and different species. And I also give tours of my propagation house and the pollinator meadow. We also have native fruit groves here. Um, we have a native service berry grove. There are two different groves. One is younger than the other. Um, I have a service berry festival every year. It's always the weekend of Father's Day, and this year will be our 15th year for it. So when I started my career, I started out as a woody plant propagator. That means I focused on propagating trees and shrubs. And the holly, specifically the American holly, Ilex opaca, just kind of kept popping up on my radar. Um, I've always been very attractive to the species itself because it is such a versatile species. It's fabulous for wildlife. It's just a wonderful native evergreen to use in place of non-native evergreens. Um, the variation in the plant is just 
just incredible according to leaf size, shape, berry color, size, shape. Um, I'm always roaming the woods and looking out for new naturally occurring selections of hollies. Well, before we dive into hollies, totally, I'm obsessed with service berries. And we did a episode on service berries not too long ago on the Garden DC podcast. And I cannot wait to come to your service berry festival this year. I'm so excited about that. Um, but can you tell our listeners who might be outside of the mid-Atlantic U.S. area a little bit about um, your area of Pennsylvania, where you're located, your growing conditions like your soil, and how close you are to some major cities? Sure. So we are south of York, Pennsylvania, by about 30 minutes, um, south on Interstate 83. We are located on the west side of the Susquehanna River um, in York County. We are about two hours west of Philadelphia. I always think that Philadelphia is much closer than it really is, but it's not. And from Baltimore, Maryland, we are about 45 minutes north off of Interstate 83. So we really, even though we're very rural, we really do have a somewhat central location. It's not that hard to find. Mm -hmm. Soil conditions here, yeah, I I have clay. Everybody asks me, you know, what plants will do well in clay. Anything I have here at my nursery does well in clay. We're very rocky. Um, Geographically, this area is considered the upper Piedmont. We have a lot of shale in our soil, a lot of clay. It can become very compressed at time. Um, Last year, we experienced two droughts, a terrible drought in May, where we didn't have any rain at all on any day in May. And then we had a drought very similar to that in August. Um, The plants here that I have in my display gardens and in my orchards did not miss a beat. Um, So that, you know, is further evidence that native plants are drought resistant and they go into a, a type of dormancy when droughts occur like that. Mm, yeah, that drought last summer and in really the springtime as well was just so devastating for a lot of local gardeners here in the Mid-Atlantic who were hit with that. And so you have a couple titles, aside from owner of your own nursery, you are president of the Holly Society of America, and you are also an adjunct plant propagation and production, I would say, instructor at CCBC Maryland. Yes, I've been um, serving consecutive terms as president for the Holly Society of America. We're a nonprofit botanical um, international organization. Um, We are one of uh, several botanical organizations in the country. I just cannot stress the importance of keeping our botanical organizations alive because botanical organizations such as the Holly Society, the Conifer Society, the Azalea Society, the Boxwood Society are just wealth of information of record keeping and Um, papers on different propagation techniques and introductions. You will find information in their archives that you just cannot locate online. And you certainly can't um, locate techniques such as what you would find in archival material um, on YouTube, the way some of the the YouTube presentations are. And I do teach plant propagation at the Community Colleges of Baltimore. And the Community Colleges of Baltimore have an absolutely fantastic horticulture program for young people who are just coming out of high school 
for anyone who is considering a second career in horticulture or anyone who just wants to maybe take one or two courses here and there just to see what horticulture is all about. That sounds wonderful. I'm sure it's really rewarding to be an instructor for the next generation. It really is. I love teaching. I love um, when someone asks me to talk about propagation or hollies or what I do or native plants. Um, It's hard to get me to stop sometimes because I very passionately (laughs) believe in, in everything I do. And I I enjoy sharing with people and I want people to get excited about it the way I am as well. Well, you kind of already addressed my first question about hollies, which was why hollies? Like what are their benefits aside from being a beautiful shrub or tree in your landscape? I would imagine the wildlife benefits are probably right up there. Yes, they are. So they're probably over 25 different species of birds that feed on the berries. Um, Yes, the leaves are spiny, um, but there are also some deciduous hollies and other species of hollies that don't have the sharp spines on the leaves. But those spines um, are there for a reason. That is the way that particular species evolved. And they act as protection for a lot of different birds and nests as well. Yeah, I don't think about hollies so much for the nesting and shelter, but that's such a great point. Yes, and I did want to mention, too, that hollies are, we're here at the nursery, we're all about hollies 365 days of the year because we work with them in the propagation house every day. Um, Springtime is a wonderful time for the hollies because each species blooms in turn. Um, so they're, they're bloom period specific. Sometimes those bloom times um, for different species may overlap. And if they do overlap, you may get a little bit of cross pollination. But in our area here, um, which it used to be zone 6B, but now I think we're zone 7, there, there's a little bit of overlap sometime, but not that much. So the the blooms on especially the male hollies attract so many beneficial pollinators to people's yards and gardens. And male hollies are not only important for pollination for the female hollies, but they are important also to attract pollinators to the garden. Um, Another fact about hollies is that they do shed their leaves in the springtime. So it is the opposite of the deciduous hollies and deciduous trees, which lose their leaves in the fall. So usually in this area, um, which again is zone between 7 and 6B, that shedding process of the inner leaves of hollies will start around March sometime, usually about the third or fourth week of March. Some years it's heavier than others. Um, It is also noticeably heavier on some selections within the species of hollies, Um, but they shed their leaves as that new growth at the tips of the branches just begin to push. And then miraculously, Hmm. they recover. Um, The foliage begins to harden off. Hopefully, the female flowers have gotten pollinated. And then the berries begin to form and develop and subsequently turn color in the fall and in the wintertime, just in time for Christmas. That is so good to know about the shedding process, because I'm sure there are some holly owners who have panicked, right, when they see that inner leaf shed. They do. We we get loads of phone calls or people will bring samples into the nursery. And um, like you said, they are panicking. They want to know what's wrong with their holly. They think their holly is dying and they're very relieved to find out that it's 
just going through its natural cycle. Yeah, I always say all evergreens shed, you know, just like we shed our skin cells and our hair. You know, you might have a full head of hair now, but you're always going to be constantly shedding or sometimes of the year you might shed more than others. Correct. Yes. Plant, the, the holly is the same way. So what you're breeding and growing at Heartwood Nursery, are they all the native hollies or do you have crosses or um, hybrids that you do as well? Okay, so um, just for clarification, I do not breed hollies. I am not a holly breeder. Mm -hmm. Um, I select hollies from naturally occurring populations. Um, So that means Mm -hmm. that if I come across a holly seedling, whether it's in my field, whether it's in my woods, whether it is in a nursery flat or container from seeds that I have sown, and it is evidencing some type of outstanding characteristic, whether it, you know, the growth rate is faster, whether it's more vigorous, If it has a strong branching structure or characteristic, maybe it's compact. Maybe the spaces between the leaves, which are called the internode, are shorter than the straight species. Maybe the leaf is darker green. Um, Sometimes we have to wait for seedlings to develop. Sometimes they don't bloom until they're four or five years old, so we don't know whether they're a male or a female. Um, We look for berry color if it does turn out to be a female. We look for all different kinds of outstanding characteristics to see um, if the retail or wholesale consumers may be interested in growing those on for sales. So it it does take a while to evaluate selections. I like to focus on native plants, so my focus is primarily on supplying the wholesale nursery trade with different selections of Ilex opaca, Um, but I am also a horticulturist and a propagator, so my greenhouse and propagation house is full of holly cuttings of all different species and crosses that people have asked me to evaluate for them or to propagate for them um, or to just try to build up some stock to make those different selections or crosses available to arboretums or people who just want to start a holly collection or who already have a holly collection in their garden. And so when you're propagating the hollies, are you doing it from cuttings or from seed so or both? We do, we do it both ways. So for the named selections and say, for example, Ilex opaca Martha's Vineyard, that is a named selection. So I have several stock plants here at my nursery and I will take semi-hardwood cuttings of those Ilex opaca Martha's Vineyard because in other words, I'm cloning that particular selection. The cloning is not a bad thing. It's a good thing because any of the seed um, that the birds distribute from Ilex opaca Martha's Vineyard will always revert back to the straight species. And that's a good point to bring up about the bird spreading holly seeds. So when they do that in your garden, are you collecting those? I know you said you're looking at them in your woodland gardens for evaluation, um, but those are not coming true, as you say. Um, Would you just weed them out? Um, You're talking to a person who would never throw a holly seedling away. Um, (laughs) <laughs> so we we do we do not weed the holly seedlings out. And my employees that work for me are always instructed, don't ever weed the holly seedlings out and throw them away. If you're weeding, you come across one, take it out and pot it up. You know, put it in put it into a container so we can observe it. 
Um, so some of my customers are also environmental organizations and they prefer to have um, the so-called uh, wild seedlings like that. They prefer to plant those out rather than planting out some of the named selections. So we, we do it both ways. But uh, the wholesale growers that I sell um, most of the American holly selection liners to, and when I say liner, I'm referring to a starter plant. So that would be say like a six to eight inch starter plant that has a very good root system on it that's been hardened off. And that wholesale customer will buy that plant. They will put it into a larger container. They will grow it on until it fills out that container. At that time, they may resell the plant. They may line it out into their own nursery production field where they may pot it up into a larger container yet. Sometimes American hollies are a little hard to find in retail centers. People don't realize how many stages and steps there are to growing a saleable American holly. So if you are fortunate enough to find them in retail garden centers, usually that holly has passed through three or four stages of growth at other nurseries prior to you taking it home and planting it in your garden. Interesting. And so most of them want to be at least a quart size, if not a gallon, correct? Yes. And surprisingly, you know, some, some customers think bigger is better. Sometimes that can be true. Um, I understand you know, in this day and age that people want to have instant gratification and they want it to look like something very quickly. Um, but hollies and other native trees and shrubs do very, very well when they're planted out from quart size or gallon size containers. And I've been in the business long enough and I've had enough feedback from my, my customers and I have certainly planted enough in our display gardens here that I know that side by side, if you plant a one gallon holly next to say a three to four foot holly that's been dug out of the field, had the root system cut, root pruned, that holly in the container, even though it's smaller, it's going to catch up to that larger bald and burlapped holly in about two to three years, and you're not going to be able to tell the difference. I'm so glad you said that, Sue. That's been my experience as well. And when I give plant talks and garden club talks, I always emphasize buy smaller, start them small if you can, and that they will catch up quickly. They do. And they root in, I, I think, from my experience and my customer feedback also, they just root in faster than it takes a bald and burlap tree to recover from that root pruning and root mm -hmm. into the soil. Yeah, it takes them so long to adapt to a new situation. It's kind of like, you know, uh, we are much more adaptable as children to change <laughs> than yeah. we are as older adults, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and that's how we have to treat them. We have to treat them like children. That does bring up when you do purchase a small holly and bring it home to your garden, what are your considerations for planting? Like site selection, um, do you plant it high in the plant hole? Um, how wide do you go for digging? That sort of thing. Yeah, so um, very, very good questions and very common questions. Um, so I'll just start with what you don't want to do first. And there are a few hollies that stay smaller than others. And I can talk about them later if, if you're interested, but if you're buying a holly that is going to grow into a large tree, you don't want to plant it up near the foundation of a house. Um, too often I've seen hollies um, go downhill in that type of situation. And that can be for many different reasons. It can be from hmm. 
heat reflecting off of that house onto the holly in the winter time at during a time when it should be dormant. It can also be from poor pH and that could be due to leaching of lime from the concrete foundation of the house into the soil. We all know that hollies prefer, they're like azaleas and rhododendrons, they prefer acidic soil. And not to mention the holly itself is going to become one-sided. It's not going to be able to develop its own natural character. Um, and it may become too big for that situation. So it's always best if you're growing a holly that is going to grow into a sizable tree to try to locate it out from your house at least by 12 feet. Um, if you can put it in the middle of the yard, the more sun you give it, the better. But also keep in mind that the holly is naturally an understory tree in the woods. So they do quite well with filtered high shade. Um, so when you're digging the hole, you don't want to dig the hole too deep. And usually you want to dig the hole twice as wide as the container or the ball that the holly is in. And you never want to put the potted or bald and burlap holly on compacted soil in the hole. So you want to make sure that that bottom soil is fluffed up. You want to remove any kind of rocks that are in the soil. You want to rough up the sides of the hole and again, fluff up the bottom. And then if anything, you want to plant the holly a little high just so that first just so that first root flare is showing um, because you're also going to cover that with the backfill of the soil you want to get any rocks out of the backfill you want to make sure that the soil you're planting it in is well drained unless you're planting Ilex verticillata, which will grow in standing water. And it doesn't need standing water to grow in, but it doesn't mind wet feet. It's used a lot for mm -hmm. riparian buffers and rain gardens and things like that. But um, it's a very versatile species of holly. It doesn't necessarily need standing water to grow, but it will tolerate it. Um, and it's natural habitat can be in standing water as well. Again, Ilex verticillata, the winterberry, is an understory plant in the woods. So it will tolerate more shade than people think. It will still bloom considerably well. And if there is a male of the same bloom time and species in the vicinity, it will pollinate and bear fruit in the shade. So you're not amending the soil in the hole with anything or adding compost or fertilizer pellets at that time? We usually don't here. I always ask the homeowner or gardener if they've had a recent soil test or how, they, how their other plants are doing in their garden. If they say they have rhododendrons and azaleas and they're doing well, and they're mature, I usually don't suggest adding anything. If someone wanted to add something, you could always add a little bit of peat moss to it at a ratio of about 50% backfill and 50% peat moss. Um, you could also add pine fines, aged pine fines, which is very, um, very minutely like shredded aged pine bark or if you have a little bit of just the general all-purpose miracle grow soil and you really you think well I just want to give you know I, I have this soil my my soil's kind of it just doesn't look that great I'm just going to add a little bit of soil to this then you could add something like the miracle grow soil but not not the type that holds water. It's just the regular miracle grow potting mix. Hollies are not that hard to grow. 
Um, they don't require a lot of fussing. Um, you don't want to baby them too much. And drainage is the big, big thing. You don't want the evergreen hollies to get too wet. If for some reason you're moving into a new house, your landscaper has everything on drip irrigation because it's newly planted um, for hollies, you would only leave the drip irrigation on for a few weeks and then you would take it off right away. Um, nothing will kill Ilex opaca or the American holly faster than too much water and planting it too much too deep. So would an indication of that be yellowing leaves? Um, it could be, but yellow, yellowing leaves could also mean that it's springtime and the holly is getting ready to shed its leaves. Yellow leaves can also mean heat stress. So yellow leaves could mean that the you know, that you need to amend the soil with some fertilizer. I always suggest holly tone fertilizer by Espona to the homeowner. It's very difficult to over fertilize with that if you just follow the directions on the back of the bag. So for, for a situation mm -hmm. like that, I usually ask people to send me pictures. And I, I have to ask a lot of mm -hmm. background questions too, because Yellow leaves on hollies can mean a lot of different things. I think that's true of many plants. It could be overwatering, underwatering. It just doesn't mean one thing. Right. And so for continuing care of your holly, uh, I know it's probably different for different varieties, but how much pruning would you do? Would it be an annual thing or not at all? Just let it form its own natural shape. I usually suggest to people that they let their holly and any of their other trees and shrubs um, for let them go for two two to three years and let them form their own natural shape. Um, I don't suggest heavily pruning hollies. I don't suggest shearing hollies. Um, I would rather see a holly that is selectively pruned rather than sheared. Shearing causes a lot of stubs, bare branches on the end, and as a consequence, the holly tends to die from the inside out. It tends to get a lot of twiggy branches inside, and then it'll just start growing leaves on the ends of the branches and appear unsightly. So for newly potted hollies, if someone were to plant hollies in the springtime and say we had another drought like we did last May, I would definitely suggest supplemental deep watering. And by deep watering, I mean you want to get jugs of water, like one gallon jugs of water, and make sure that you are thoroughly getting that soil wet down to the bottom of the root system and it's draining off. Um, and giving it supplemental watering like that, like a, that during a drought. Um, probably two to three times a week if the plant is newly planted. Mm. So hollies that were planted last year, say we have another drought this year, you may want to give them some supplemental watering maybe once a week if it looks like they're struggling. But we've had a lot of moisture so far. So hopefully we'll, we'll be in a good position with that this year. And it's, as far as pruning goes, I usually say wait for about two to three years. Good to know. And it sounds like holly is one of the most perfect low maintenance plants out there. It really is. And hollies will also go into a summer dormancy in August. Um, most people don't associate heat with dormancy, but hollies just they're very hardy. They're very tenacious. Another window of opportunity to transplant a holly or plant a holly is during the month of August because they do go into that summer dormancy. We have moved very large hollies here at the nursery in August, digging them up with a tree spade that we have. 
and relocating them and they just don't miss a beat. Um, they start growing again in the fall. We give them supplemental watering. They've done very well over the winter time and they have average leaf shedding in the springtime. So August is a good time to work with hollies as well. Something to add to our summer to-do list for the garden. Excellent. So the $100,000 question and the one I'm sure you get almost every day, Sue, why is my holly not producing berries? Yes. Okay. So that could mean a variety of things. It could mean that your holly is a female and there are no males of the same species or blooming at the same time close enough to pollinate the holly. It could also mean that the holly is a male and male, we know male hollies do not get berries. So there, there are a variety of reasons. A lot of comments that I get to, to, in addition to the question is, I've never seen blooms on my holly. That could be true as well if it's a random seedling, if you're just not looking at the right time. So hollies will begin to bloom probably sometime in April, late April into May, into June. You just have to be very observant. Holly flowers are very tiny. Um, unless the tree is really optimally growing and out in the open, it may not get a lot of flowers on it. Sometimes they'll only develop one or two flowers and it could be on the branches high above and you're just not noticing. With winterberry, win winterberry is actually a more common question that I get. People will say my winter berry had berries on it when I bought it. I've had it for three years. It has not developed berries. Usually that's because so, you don't have a male winter berry that blooms at the same time. Yes, but the nursery I got it at sold me a male along with that. Well, with winter berry hollies, they bloom in different time increments. There are early blooming winter berries. There are mid season blooming winter berries, and there are late season blooming winter berries. And you need a compatible late blooming male to pollinate a late blooming female, a late blooming, a mid blooming male to pollinate a mid blooming female, and an early blooming male to pollinate an early blooming female. However, since we're dealing with nature and we know how mother nature can be, she likes to throw us a, a kink sometimes, or she likes to prove us wrong, especially with um, our temperatures increasing over the past few years. So very, very gradually that theory there and that evidence is kind of getting changed because Last year in particular, we noticed that male winter berries um, were blooming a little bit later and a little bit earlier. There was some overlap in the early and the mid blooming males and females. There was some overlap in the mid to late blooming males and females. So now to be on the safe side, we just recommend to the customer to buy several males. Um, to ensure pollination for their female. And that would be usually if you buy an early blooming male and a late blooming male, then you should definitely have berries on your female winter berry. And so if you have a small size garden or, you know, in a city plot, or urban lot, maybe get together with some neighbors and make sure you have a variety of males there available. Yes, get together with some neighbors. There are some nice dwarf male winter berries on the market. You know, aesthetically, it may not be very pleasing to plant 
a dwarf male winterberry right next to the female winterberry, but I know people who have small yards with limited space have done this before. It just may mean that you may have some bare branches in that particular area intermixed in with the female holly that is getting the, the berries on the female branches. Um, so that is an option as well. Certainly, building, buildings and obstructions can affect transport of pollen to other plants. And how far would that distance be? In an urban situation, I would say if you have a male and a female, like in a development, an established development, housing development, I would say probably a quarter mile, maybe, maybe between a quarter mile and a half a mile. Um, In rural areas, you know, there are plenty of male hollies in the woods around here, female hollies. It can be up to five miles. Bees fly. Ants travel. Ants are fabulous pollinators of hollies as well. And bees fly. And birds, you know, birds carry pollen as well. They get it on their feathers. Good to know that they don't have to be side by side and that they can be of some distance. So if you're near... A park or wildlife refuge, you could borrow some of that pollen too. Correct. Yes, I've known people um, that have come here and asked me, can I have a branch of one of your male hollies and take it home for my female? And I'm, I say, sure, <laughs> here you go. And they get berries. So. Nice. So um, for our last part of this segment about hollies, let's talk about some favorite varieties. Um, Maybe some dwarf uh, that would be good for the small space gardener and maybe some of your favorite personal selections. Okay. So as as we talked about earlier and we referenced um, hollies as children, it it's kind of like asking me if I have a favorite child when it comes to hollies, but there are some that just are, there, there's some that are just outstanding performers. And so you mentioned the dwarf, so we'll start there. And certainly Ilex opaca Maryland dwarf is a selection that comes to mind. Um, you may know that selection. I'm sure that many of your listeners are familiar with that selection, but I'm going to mention the attributes anyway. Uh So being that it is a native species, Ilex opaca, I find that a lot of my native customers that come in retail and wholesale, they want something low. They want an evergreen native that is low and Certainly, Maryland Dwarf Holly fits that bill. It can be selectively pruned to keep even lower. The mature height is probably about four feet. I have seen some that get up to five feet, but those are very old specimen and they've never been pruned. It does grow horizontally much faster then it grows vertically in height. It is true to its name. It is a spreading holly. It is a dwarf holly. It looks fantastic in smaller gardens. It looks good in rock gardens. Um, It's very versatile on a bank, on a lawn. It can, if you don't want to mow your bank, I have a friend who planted about 75 of these all along her bank and she planted aromatic aster in front of it for fall color. And the planting itself is about, it's about six years old and it is just absolutely beautiful. Sounds gorgeous. It's a female. So it does, does get berries. Um, And it's a really nice, low, very, very densely branched holly. So it is a a safe haven for uh, ground-dwelling birds and small mammals in the winter. And very, very minimal shedding in the springtime. Very, very hardy, very tough plant. 
Um, usually the hardiest, and I have found this in my experience as a propagator and grower, the plants, uh, selections of hollies that root the most vigorously and grow the most vigorously from a very young age have the minimal shedding of leaves in the springtime. So that would be one of my favorite. I do hear so many people singing the praises of Maryland Dwarf. Yeah. So another one would be a lesser known spreading holly. It's called Clarendon spreading. It gets a little bit taller than Maryland Dwarf. Um, I like to compare the branching structure inside of that particular selection to that of a Japanese maple. Um, The branching structure is absolutely beautiful. It's very heavy. It is also a female and it tends to bear more fruit than the Maryland dwarf. Very, very nice holly. Um, A little bit slower growing than Maryland dwarf as well. As far as my favorite upright tree, Ilex opaca hollies that grow into the typical holly tree, that would be a selection called Old Heavy Berry. Um, It's a very, very old selection known for its consistent berry set, dark red berry set every year. Very beautiful, dark green, lustrous leaves. Um, Another upright, very classic selection is Ilex opaca Miss Helen. Miss Helen um, is an older selection as well. It was selected back in the 1940s uh, in Baltimore County and is very graceful, very medium growth rate holly. And uh, the branches are not pendulous, but they're very, very graceful. And it's a nice, very typical representative of the species holly tree and has pretty bright emerald green leaves and reliable berry set. Also, um, Ilex opaca, there are many yellow fruiting selections that get the yellow berries. They are just beautiful in the winter time. The very bright spot in the garden with yellow berries, I take some of those as samples to the Mid-Atlantic Nursery Trade Show every year. They're very eye-catching. They always attract a lot of attention. So people that have enough room to plant hollies with red berries may want to consider planting one or two yellow fruiting American hollies. Um, In the Holly Society for this year, every year we choose a Holly of the Year. This year, our choice is the Yellow Fruiting Ilex Opaca Longwood Gardens. It is on the cover. It will be on the cover of our first journal for 2024 that will be coming out in a few weeks. So there is another yellow berry holly that is just fabulous. Again, your listeners may be aware of this one. Um, It is a result of a natural occurring hybridization. Um, It's a cross between Ilex opaca and Ilex cassine. Uh, The name of it is Ilex attenuata longwood gold. And this particular attenuata is absolutely gorgeous. It is extremely cold hardy, where some of the other attenuata selections are not as cold hardy. Longwood Gold has proven to be hardy to zone six. The berries are a beautiful deep gold color. The leaves um, actually turn kind of a greenish maroon when they're exposed to the colder temperatures and they're very long and slender. It's a very, very beautiful holly. And they're two very large specimens of Ilex attenuata longwood gold at Longwood Gardens. So I've done a lot of speaking about native hollies. I do have some non-native choices for favorite hollies as well, if I could just speak about them briefly. 
Um, one is Ilex. Oh, definitely. Yes. One is Ilex pedunculosa. That is the long stalk holly. I just cannot think of a better non-native holly to plant. Um, the leaves are very soft. They're oval. Um, it is an evergreen. It does have minimal shedding in the springtime. The berries are born at the end of very long stems, and that is refers to the species um, pedunculosa at the end of these long peduncles. And usually they're born individually. Sometimes, sometimes um, you'll get a double berry or even maybe a triple berry, but uh, most of the time they're born singly. It's absolutely beautiful holly. This year, the pollination was perfect. Uh, the females were just loaded with berries. When people see the tree, they're just shocked that it's a holly because it doesn't look anything like a holly. Um, the deer hate it, and that is a proven fact in every state in this country that it's grown in, and it is a proven fact in every country around the world that it is grown in as well. The deer do not eat Ilex pedunculosa. Um, what better holly could could you have in an urban situation that, that the deer aren't going to bother. Another species of holly that um, we grow here and is becoming more available is Ilex coniana, and that's spelled with a K. Um, that is the coney holly. The difference in that non-native holly between other hollies is that the flowers occur on the previous year's wood. So the berries um, occur kind of inside the branching structure of the tree, but the leaves can be up to four to five inches long. They're very um, thick. They're very waxy. They look fabulous in wreaths and arrangements. Um, for those cut flower growers out there, any of these hollies that I'm speaking about are fantastic for um, wreaths and cut arrangements at Christmas time. Winterberry hollies, obviously, Ilex fertisolata, you've heard of winter red, you've probably heard of uh, winter, sorry, not winter, um, Maryland Beauty is another fabulous selection. There's another selection called Mary Jo, which is a bright red early blooming female fertisolata. The berries are born to the tips of the branches on very, very long stems, which makes it a very popular selection for cut flower growers and for those who make arrangements as well. So those, those are some of the hollies when I think about hollies that I get excited about. The most popular Native American holly that is in the trade and has been in the trade for years, I'm sure your listeners have heard about it, is Ilex opaca Sater hill. Um, that is another holly that was discovered as a chance seedling in the woods in Baltimore County when there used to be a lot more woods in Baltimore County than there is now. Um, but the fabulous selection as well. It has a wide um, palmate leaf, very bright, dark emerald green, somewhat of a compact branching habit, very vigorous, consistent, reliable berry set every year. But as I say, Sater Hill has been around for a long time. Sometimes it's the only American holly you can find. Um, people in the holly society are trying to add to the availability of different opaca and some of the older opaca. And we have a lot of newer selections that are being registered now to make newer selections and some of these older selections available too. So the consumer has a choice when it comes to American hollies. Yeah, I think we're going to be excited to see some of those new 
offerings on the market in a few years, maybe more like five to 10 years, knowing how um, the wholesale cycle goes. But I'm really grateful, Sue, for you sharing all this holly knowledge, your passion for the plants and propagation really shows through. And how can listeners contact you to find out more? Um, well, first of, first of all, I'd like to thank you again. It's been fun. And again, I, I love sharing what I do with people. Um, if you'd like to contact me, you can email me at heartwoodnurseryinc at gmail.com. And it's spelled heart, like H-E-A-R-T, heartwoodnurseryinc, I-N-C, at gmail.com. I also have um, a pretty popular Facebook following. So the name of the Facebook page is Heartwood Nursery and Environmental Preserve. For the Holly Society, the website for the Holly Society is hollysociety.org. And of course, if you are interested in taking any horticulture classes at the community colleges of Baltimore. That website is ccbcmd.edu. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you. Osteospermums, plant profile, African daisy, Osteospermum species is a tender perennial that is sold as a cool season annual. It thrives in the shoulder seasons of our mid-Atlantic growing year, similar to pansies and sweet alyssum. They are hardy to USDA zones 9 through 11. They have a daisy-like bloom that is available in a range of colors from pinks to peaches to purples and bicolors. African daisies prefer to grow in the full sun in evenly moist but well-draining soils. They do well in containers. They attract pollinators and are an ideal cup flower. To encourage blooming, add a slow-release fertilizer when you plant them and apply a liquid fertilizer every two weeks after that. Deadhead them frequently. In the summer, you can cut the whole plant back to encourage new growth and flowers by autumn. They do not usually grow true from seed, but you can propagate them from cuttings or experiment by collecting the seeds and seeing what you get from them. Osteospermums, you can grow that. What's going on in the garden this week? Well, everything is buried in a layer of snow and ice, so I'm not touching any of that and just letting it sit and thaw. Meanwhile, I'm enjoying the indoor blooms of my African violets and miniature roses. Some garden tasks that we shared this week include to clean out your greenhouse and wash those windows. Vent the cold frames that you have on sunny days so you don't cook your greens underneath them. Feed birds and provide them with a fresh water source. And we shared a few botanical vocabulary terms that you might enjoy. You can check out our garden tip of the day on Twitter slash X at WDC Gardener, at our Facebook page, Washington Gardener Magazine, or by joining the Washington Gardener Google group. A couple upcoming local gardening events in the Washington, D.C. area that you might be interested in attending include the Future of Orchids Conservation and Collaboration opening on January 27th and going through April 28th in the Cogood Courtyard of the Smithsonian American Art Museum and National Portrait Galleries in downtown Washington, D.C., this is a partnership of the Smithsonian Gardens Orchid Collection and the U.S. Botanic Gardens Collection. So I recommend 
visiting a few times over the course of that ex exhibition as different plants are brought in and out of peak bloom and you'll be seeing different things as you go each time. So check that out at gardens.si.edu. And then our friends at the Hyattsville Horticultural Society have brought back their annual seed sale and that is happening live in person at the Hyattsville, Maryland Municipal Building on February 10th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. In addition to the seed sale, they'll have homemade foods and beverages. They'll be available to ask gardening questions. They'll have used gardening books and supplies at bargain prices and a Valentine making craft corner for kids of all ages. You can find out more about that at HyattsvilleHorticulture.org. Happy gardening! Get low maintenance alternative to lawns with the new book Ground Cover Revolution by Kathy Jentz. Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco friendly alternative to a traditional everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Cordo.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jentz and Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. Hey there, garden lovers. This is Ray Eaton, founder of Discover Garden Tours. I'm here to invite you all to join us next April and experience the beauty of Dutch gardening and horticulture on our Discover the Netherlands tour. Please join us and speaker, author, and social media influencer Kathy Jentz for this once-in-a-lifetime garden adventure. We'll visit private and public gardens, flower shows and auctions, and much, much more. Highlights include the Kuchenhof Gardens, Hortus Botanicus Leiden, and the Flora Holland Flower Auction. The tour dates are from April 16th through April 25th, 2024. Full details and registration are available on our website at discoverourtours.com. Remember, space is limited, so if you don't want to miss out, I would highly recommend signing up today. We look forward to seeing you in the Netherlands and sharing this unforgettable journey together. This is The Last Word by Christy Page with GreenPrints.com on starting the new year off with a bang and keeping that momentum going all year long. Now, I'm a creature of habit. I like having the same rituals and traditions year after year. And my town has a cute New Year's Eve tradition called Starry Starry Night. 
and this has been my family's New Year's Eve tradition for years now. It's an event that the local businesses all get together to sponsor. There's usually a small parade, ice sculptures in the square, a fire pit and hot cocoa station at the fire department, and a variety of venues with entertainment. You might be going to the town hall to see a magician and then to the church to do some dancing. It is a night full of community togetherness and wholesome fun. And for years, we've been able to wander around visiting with friends and neighbors as the kids rush from activity to activity. We're always so very thankful to the crafting stations at the Outfitter store, the cookies handed out by local various clubs, and all of the different variety shows. The star of the evening is always the fireworks. Now we're a very small town and we do not wait until midnight to set off the fireworks. By midnight, we're all home and in jammies waiting for the big ball to drop, or at least I know I am. So at about 9.30 p.m., we all gather around the town square while the local fire department oversees the fireworks display. It may be small and it may not last very long, but it's always so much fun to watch. So as the last sparkle flickers in the sky, we all grab our last cup of hot cocoa and a cookie if there are any left and start wandering home. This is our way of celebrating the end of the year and a start of a new one with our friends and family. New Year's Day dawns and all of the possibilities of a new year are upon us. Some people like to make resolutions. This year, I'm going to stop X or complete Y. Some people like to set goals. This year, I'm definitely going to do Z. Me, I'm a little simpler. Each year, I set expectations for myself. This year, I'd like to find the positive in each day. This year, I'd also like to try a little harder to learn something new. This year, I would like to grow squash without killing them. Nothing too tough to tackle. Well, except maybe the squash. Anyway, look at it. It's a new year. It's a time for new beginnings and chances. It's a time to tackle anything that you set your mind to. And this year, I want to tackle more in my garden. So right now, while I get to have that quiet time of winter where I'm planning for the new year, but nothing to worry about just yet, I'm sitting here thinking of everything I want to accomplish in 2024 and hope that you have a wonderful year as well. This has been Christy Page with GreenPrints.com. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to podcasters.spotify.com slash pod slash show slash Garden DC. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.blogspot.com. Thank you. You can find and follow Washington Gardener on Twitter, slash X, Instagram, and Pinterest at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook at Washington Gardener Magazine. Please take a moment to rate and review this podcast on Spotify and Apple. Open the Spotify or Apple app, search for Garden DC, check on the rate button, and select five stars.